Joining us today on the podcast, we've got Commissioner of the Canadian Elite Basketball League, Mr. Mike Morielli. Mike, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How about yourself? Oh, can't complain. The sun is shining out there, so if we, we're finally getting some summer weather. It's looking like we can finally emerge from our, our COVID lockdown hibernation slowly but surely, so it's getting good. We're, we're, we're coming around the corner. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, obviously you guys have been preparing for a while now, but big news just dropped this week as well. You finally got the 100% green light from the provincial governments that all of your hard work is indeed going to come to fruition and season three is a go. How much of a relief is that? Oh, it, you know, it, it's a tremendous relief, but it's very short lived because it's like, okay, we got it. Great. Now back to work. Uh, so uh, but it is a, a comfort to not have that that stressful part kind of weighing on you as you're preparing. So um, that was a good day when we got those uh, those calls for sure. Yeah. And if we rewind to last year, obviously you had to do the bubble format there and, you know, you guys make it look easy on television, but I'm sure there's a million and one moving parts going on behind the scenes. So for those who might not be a, an event management specialist or something like that, like <laughs> what kind of logistics actually went into pulling off that bubble and having the success that you did without any, you know, outbreaks or positive cases or anything coming from that there? Well, I mean, it was a tremendous amount of work. What, what would have taken us, you know, last year, four or five months to plan and execute, we did in four or five weeks. So it was all hands on deck. And it was at the same time, working with, you know, other third parties, like our hotel partner or our training partner or the Meridian Center, where we played to make sure that they were at the same speed we were and able to accommodate us. And of course, you're dealing with 250 plus people um, who have their own beliefs on COVID and their own emotions tied to it, uh, let alone making sure you get players in and out of the country through the border and they got a quarantine and, and set up practice time and, and workout time and, and the schedule and broadcasters, I can go on and on. But it is a, uh, uh, it gives you a sense of the, the, the multiple moving parts. Um, and all along that time, we're, we were still awaiting our approvals at that point last year. So you add the, the complexities of the stress that comes with that. And, and you know, a regular game day is, is stressful. But you're, when you're doing 26 regular game days, all within a condensed period of time with a bunch of moving parts, it has its moments, but it's the end result that counts. And it, uh, it worked out fantastic. And, uh, and we will benefit from that uh, going into this year as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously it was super high level basketball, lots of memorable moments on the court and all that that happened. But I'm just curious, sort of as a commissioner there, were, were there any memorable moments maybe off the court uh, and that really just came together that you'll remember moving forward, looking back on your time in the bubble there? Yeah, I mean, there were so many, I, I guess, you know, little check marks along the way, but it's hard to really appreciate them till you're, till you're all said and done. So my favorite part was the end with the confetti coming down and I was happy for anyone to win, of course, as the commissioner, but I was really happy for our staff, um, not only here in the league office, but across the league to, to be a part of something and accomplish something that very, very few people uh, would have had the ability to accomplish or the opportunity. I'm not sure anybody wants the opportunity, but uh, it's, a, it's a feather in the cap for us moving forward, for sure. Yeah. And on top of obviously global pandemic, you're in a bubble, all these changes already, you guys must have been glutton for punishment because you decided to add another wrinkle and introduce the Elam ending as well last year too. So what was the feedback that you got from both players, coaches, fans, as far as it being implemented into the game? Well, the initial feedback from a basketball point of view was not like overwhelmingly, hey, that's awesome. It's, you know, you're adding something to the bat to the sport. When you when the basketball people, the coaches, the players and everything enters into kind of what we're doing, the complexity changes because now it's very competitive, very, you know, everything's about winning and, and you know, nothing will stay in their way. And that's great. That's what we want. But when you add a little wrinkle at first, it's like, yeah, I'm not too sure. But they, to their credit, all the coaches and players, everybody jumped in. And, and I think overwhelmingly uh, were happy with the results. And, and, you know, most importantly is we did a big deep data dive at the end of it with Dr. Elam, who created the Elam ending. And he analyzed every game, um, every situation, and really broke it down to numbers for us. So then, it, then you can actually look at it and, and see in black and white 
did this actually work as we had planned it? And it did. It worked perfectly. So, you know, the big thing for us this year, and we may not see it in Ontario, we may not see it in BC, but, you know, we'll, we'll probably in Saskatchewan and Edmonton see this Elam ending in action in front of fans at some point. And that's really what it's all about. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great way. It's the best way to end a basketball game. Uh, but the fan part of it is what makes it even more exciting. Yeah. And obviously that's the million dollar question at this point is obviously we've got all of these fans from coast to coast who want to see their hometown teams in action. And, you know, and here we are in Ottawa, we've had the blackjacks, but we haven't seen them play a single game yet aside right. from on television. So have you guys gotten any kind of indication from the provincial governments or public health units as far as, okay, we, we know you want fans back, but we need such and such a threshold to have been passed or we need to reach such a vaccination rate. Like, have they given you any kind of indication of markers that you guys need to meet to get fans back in the stands? They have, and it's really what everyone has seen. So it's the, it's the public kind of rollout stages plan and every, every province is slightly different, but in Alberta and in Saskatchewan, Alberta has said basically by the end of June or beginning of July, if everything stays and they hit the targets and vaccination and, and hospitalizations, that it's a full go reopening. So that's encouraging. Um, so we are preparing now for, for fans in those markets. And it still remains to be seen how and when and how many, because that'll be kind of step two um, that we're working on. And then in Saskatchewan, it's very similar. They're looking at June, July 11th-ish for kind of a, a more massive reopening. And then in BC, Ontario, it's if you look at the stage planned reopening, it's going to be probably near the end or beyond our regular season um, schedule, but that's okay. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to work within the guidelines. That's most important. And we'll work with public health if and when those things changes. And we've seen other provinces move up their, their uh, planned reopening because things are going well. So uh, I, I'm bullish on it, but at the same time, I'm mentally prepared that if we don't, we don't. But we have put, specific to Ottawa, we have put in a request uh, on behalf of uh, the Blackjacks to the premier to see if we can't get, you know, 300 uh, uh, fully vaccinated healthcare workers into the building for the first three games, just to, as a, an appreciation, of course, and as a way to kind of see what it's like when we do eventually reopen, right? And not just for us, but even for other sports that play in venues uh, like ours. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, knock on wood here, hopefully the Blackjacks go on a nice deep playoff run and then we can actually get some more yeah. in the building and <laughs> extend that timeline a little bit. But Outside of the bubble itself, you know, what kind of changes from last year to this year might we see? Like, for example, last year in the bubble, you obviously had no benches. They were all sort of scattered in individual chairs and all that. Is that sort of a regional thing where if it's a game in, let's say, Edmonton, you know, there'll be player benches. But if it's a game in Ottawa, they're going to be spread out. Like, how is that sort of thing working out this year? Yeah, so we every team will have very similar protocols. So even if there's a, a full reopening, the player benches will still be staggered and there'll still be plexiglass between you know, the minor officials and the broadcasters and mask wearing, et cetera. So that will stay the same. And that's just how that's written into the protocols that have been approved. And that's part of going above and beyond. Um, now, will that be replicated from fans in the building? It all depends. It really depends on, on local public health, but we're going to take that approach. And um, the, the players are good with it. I mean, it's it's become commonplace. So in that respect, they've, they've come off European seasons or other seasons where they're used to it. So they just want to play basketball. So in that respect, things will stay relatively the same um, because we want to be just a few notches above what, what is recommended for the general public because we want to, we want to complete our season and have a good season. Yeah. So if we put the global pandemic aside here and just look at your entire run as commissioner, what's been maybe one of the challenges or more challenging aspects of the role of commissioner of a professional sports league that you maybe didn't anticipate running into ahead of time? That's a good question. I mean, everything is a challenge when you're starting from scratch. Everything's exciting when you're starting from scratch. Everything's very creative. So um, there's no special challenges let's say but there are you know the way we operate is different from other leagues I think the challenge may be in this landscape is is trying to let people know and you know people in in, in government or people in power that we are different than the NBA or the NHL or Major League Baseball we're not run by you know billionaire owners uh, based out of the U.S. 
we're a made in Canada league played by Canadians and played and made for Canadians. And, you know, I, I think we've become more um, important to the, the grassroots development and the pathway and, and the uh, amateur side than some of the major leagues do because their thought processes are different and they're supported differently. So those are challenging situations because you still, as a young, let's say startup league still, you, you want a challenge to be recognized and be noticed, um, not just here, but internationally. And, and sometimes in basketball, you can be, you know, we're, we're recognized internationally, maybe more than we are domestically in some times. And that's just based on some, how Canadians sometimes look at their pro sports leagues, if they're Canadians. And, but those challenges to me are just opportunities, to be honest with you. Yeah. And you hit on something there in the sense that you guys have, you know, there have been various iterations of professional basketball leagues in Canada over the years, but you guys have really made a concentrated effort to be aligned with Basketball Canada, to get involved with the U sport system and, you know, having your U sport draft and all of that there. Are we going to be looking at eventually getting more involved with the U sport draft and expanding beyond the current, what I think it's three rounds that you guys currently do for the draft? Like we're going to five or seven, like what's sort of the future for the CEBL, the U sport, the basketball Canada? Do you guys have anything five years down the line that you would love to get to one day? Well, yeah, we're working on now a lot of kind of uh, expanding, you know, our presence beyond our four month season. So getting into more international events, more relationships with international federations, more FIBA related events, representing Canada on behalf of Canada basketball. Um, our youth sports partnership is great. Um, and not, it's not just limited to the draft. Obviously we can pick up players as free agents, et cetera. So there are, you know, quite a few players, but um, that will continue to grow. I think and the talent levels there that it, it's going to be less about we need to segment this small amount just for there. I think it's just going to be we're going to get the best players and that includes you sports. And that's what happens. Um, same with Canadian College. We don't have a draft for Canadian College, but we still pick up uh, Canadian College players. Right. So if, if you're a good player, you're going to get noticed and we'll provide the opportunity to do so. And then the real opportunity, I think, for us beyond you know Canada is the international piece right now. It's predominantly U.S. players, G League players, you know, high level uh, players that played out in Europe, et cetera, played in the NBA or draft picks, which are fantastic. But we also want to add that international development. So a Japanese player, a Filipino player, uh, you know, a European, Italian, whatever. We really want to grow that. And COVID's throwing a bit of a hiccup in that, obviously, because the borders and travel. But that's on, our, on the horizon for sure. Yeah. And speaking of expansions, you guys recently announced that gearing up for 2022 you guys are looking at Montreal as a possible expansion franchise there how did you guys ultimately settle on Montreal as being the next location that you guys are looking to put place a franchise in for the CBL I think Montreal has been a location from day one but you know because of how we operate as a single entity we have to make sure we can actually you know accomplish what we want to accomplish in a certain period of time so you know we started with six teams we added Ottawa for our seventh last year um, we wanted to be in Ottawa in the beginning, but Ottawa is a bit of a special market. You know, there's the bilingual nature to it. It's a big city. We want to make sure we approached it properly, which is why we took our time. And the same reason we took our time for Montreal. Montreal is a massive market, obviously the biggest francophone market, but also becomes our biggest market before we add some other teams down the route road and, you know, truly bilingual. So you have to be prepared in different ways and in how you approach it and, and how it's accepted locally. So you know, that, that takes some time, but there's other markets, there's Winnipeg, there's Calgary, there's, you know, BC or Kelowna, and there's the out East, or that's Newfoundland and Halifax and uh, Quebec city is a national, like, natural extension to Montreal. So there uh, we've approached everything the same. We just have to be very smart in how we do it and consistent in how we do it and, and take our time. And, and sometimes we wait and sometimes we won't. I think, you know, there are markets we want to get to, and we'll get there quicker than, than we have to, or qu quicker than we have in the past, because we know our business a lot better now. Yeah. On top of the expansion announcement, you guys also decided you're going to try and crowdsource some of the ideas around the team itself. So everything from the team name to colors and logos, all of that good stuff. 
Now, anytime you open things up to public opinion, you're going to get a wide variety of submissions, right? Everything from really high end polished stuff that mm -hmm. might actually be in the consideration for logos and that to, you know, Steve's being a jackass and submitted this name there <laughs> and it's never going to get considered. Have you guys started to actually sort through any of those fan submissions yet? And if so, like, what has the response sort of been like on that front? Yeah, no, the response was great. Within a week, we've had over a thousand, you know, when we first did over a thousand submissions, I haven't even gone back to look since then. Uh, but we've taken a lot of that information, we've compiled it, we've used it as a point of reference. And there are some terrible ones. So the typical, hey, I'm in Ontario, name them the poutines. I mean, we get it, but it's probably not a joke to them as we're <laughs> looking at it. But, you know, and then there's some really good ones. And there's really concepts that maybe don't work for Montreal, but kind of make you think, hey, that might be good for another one down the road, right? You try and balance what you're trying to do. So the response has been tremendous. The process has been started. Um, we are, you know, close to narrowing down the team name and, and colors and logos and everything for a, a public launch later this summer. So um, the, the fans have played a major part in that because they, they, bring up ideas and they, they bring up local ideas that maybe we don't think of. And we have, we have team on the ground there. That's obviously local to, uh, to Montreal. So that, that is a big thing. It's not just a bunch of guys sitting back here making decisions and not knowing. Um, so, you know, but the, the fan interest has been very important. Yeah. And if, when you guys do sort of narrow it down, are you looking to then launch, say, a final five and again, do sort of the public ballot and see what the reaction is like there? Or are you guys, all right, this is your chance to get your input in now and we'll ultimately make sort of that decision and say, by the way, Montreal will be called the blanks moving forward. How's that process going to roll out? Yeah, I think we're just going to go right to the to the end product. Um, not because, you know, we want to skip a step, but, you know, I, I think we know where we want to go and um, and it's because of all the, the stuff that's been submitted and it, you know, they're, they're wide range of submissions and we want to look at it that way rather than narrowing it down. We'll, we'll narrow it down in the context of really large to big and um, and that way save up a little bit of a surprise and allow us to work on things as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier some other possible expansion locations, everything from East Coast to West Coast and everywhere else in between there. But, you know, looking down the line, maybe five, even 10 years, like as a commissioner, what's sort of that sweet spot as far as total number of teams you'd eventually like to get? Because you don't want to get oversaturated with teams and not be able to support the league anymore there. But what's that sort of sweet spot number? Is it 15? Is it 20? What, what do you think? It's, it's 15 to 16, or pardon me, 14 to 16. You know, we want to stay away from the odd numbers because it always throws a wrench into, into scheduling. But, uh, and then move to a more divisional model, whether that's a, a west, a central, and an east. And then that changes the, the travel implications. Right now we travel all across the country, uh, a little bit limited this year because of COVID, but that's where we're looking to get to. And uh, initially it was 12. And then we realized, I think we're selling ourselves short here. There's some real opportunities. There's some markets that we'd like to be in. And there's also other markets that popped up we never thought of that we'd like to be in too. So it will be done in a very smart, uh, pragmatic way. And we'll take our time to do it. But at the same time, there's, there's a, a lot of interest. So getting to that number in the next three, four, five years is, is not a, as much of a challenge um, as one would think. Mm -hmm. And obviously being a new league takes time to get some of those rivalries up and running. And, you know, you, you mentioned Montreal, it would be great to get to Quebec city and then have that natural rivalry there and all of that. But just even in, you know, season three about to kick off, what are some of the budding rivalries that you've noticed as a commissioner that are, you know, there's a little something extra to those games when two teams meet there. Well, yeah, I think the Southern Ontario teams have a great little rivalry amongst each other. You know, everybody seems to not like one another, which is, which is great. You know, I, it, it, not like it in, in the right sense of the word. Like there's a lot of competition, whether it's Niagara versus uh, Hamilton or, or Hamilton versus Guelph or, or vice versa. Ottawa is, is still kind of feeling that out, but with Montreal coming, that's a natural extension. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll find some more rivalries uh, brew this year in, in the Southern Ontario market. And then we have those kind of rivalries that have existed in um, out West for a while. And, and all three are kind of 
they're yeah they don't like each other and it's all come naturally i think that's the most important we're not trying to create rivalries they have to be created by the fans themselves and we just kind of benefit from them so they're well on their way but there will be more and every year that kind of emerges you know different groups that maybe you know last year we ended up fraser valley against the world uh, i don't think anyone liked playing them and they didn't like playing anybody else and and so it's it's a fun process to watch happen in, in front of your eyes yeah all right. Well, before we let you go here, I mean, I'm already a season ticket holder for the Blackjack, so oh, you nice. got me hook, line, and sinker. But if there was someone out there who wasn't familiar with the CEBL and wasn't sort of sure, okay, well, maybe I'll buy a ticket and sort of figure out what it's like there. What's sort of your elevator pitch on what they can expect at a CEBL game once fans are eventually let back into stadiums and all of that? Yeah, listen, this is the best basketball in this country outside of the Toronto Raptors. Uh, no doubt about it. Um, it's high level entertainment played by some of the best Canadian talent uh, that is playing professionally all over the world. And we're just bringing them back and showcasing them in our home markets. Uh, and these are people, you know, or people you went to school with or people you heard of or you watched on TV. And it's an entertainment package. We, we play basketball, but you're there for you know, the, the pregame, the during the game, the half game, the DJs, the music, the excitement, um, and the fact that we're a spring and summer sport, it, it affords the ability to be and entertain yourself outside and, and be the start of the night or the end of the night or, or what have you, a great family outing, a great outing with, you know, friends um, and a real fun time. Amazing. Well, the season kicks off June 24th. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. We really appreciate it. Best of luck with season three of the CEBL. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on.